Good afternoon and welcome to the Midday News. Here's what we have in the bulletin. Active COVID-19 cases on the rise in Westmoreland, but why? The plea from the World Health Organization as the Delta variant causes worry among vaccinated people. And later in sports, Chris Gale scores first T20 international half century since 2016 as West Indies beat Australia by six wickets in St. Lucia. I'm Vashon Brown and here are the details. The number of active cases of COVID-19 in Westmoreland has been increasing. That revelation at the latest municipal corporation meeting. It's why health officials in the parish are pleading with residents to obey the COVID-19 protocols. Sandy Williams has more in this report. On Thursday, the number of active COVID-19 cases stood at 12,216. On Friday, that figure dropped to 11,237. By Saturday, Jamaica recorded 10,230 active cases and on Sunday, 9,237. The number of active cases in Jamaica trending down. But while there may be an overall decline, Westmoreland has been seeing an increase in active cases. According to Chief Executive Officer at the Savannah Lamar Hospital, Camille Lewin, the cases are also among children below 19 years. We have 69 who are in the 40s in more recent weeks. We have persons, 10 persons in hospital, and we have also noted that among our active cases, we are seeing more children. We have 12 children. Ms. Lewin says the number of children infected with COVID-19 is a cause for concern. Last month, Director of Family Health Services in the Ministry of Health and Wellness, Dr. Melody Ennis, had said Jamaica is not yet in a position to give COVID-19 vaccines to children. Ms. Lewin also revealed that majority of the active cases are household clusters. When somebody is diagnosed, and we do the contact investigation and we test the close contacts, we are having a significant amount of close contacts of confirmed persons becoming positive. With the reopening of the entertainment sector, Ms. Lewin points out that there is an increased risk of transmission. So I'm asking persons, when you go on the road, please observe the protocol. Because most of us relax when we are at home among our family members, our loved ones, and you don't want to pick up something out the street that you're going to carry home, spread, and make yourself or your loved ones sick. And we are seeing a lot of households coming down with COVID-19 clusters. Sandy Williams, TVJ News. Still on COVID, with reports that people who are vaccinated against the coronavirus are being infected with the Delta variant, the World Health Organization, WHO, is urging people to still take the jab. Shamela Pullen has that report. So far, the Delta variant has been detected in at least 104 countries. That's according to the World Health Organization, WHO, at a media briefing on Monday. But what's concerning is that some of these persons infected with the Delta variant have been vaccinated against COVID-19. And yes, uh, there are reports coming in that uh, vaccinated, uh, in vaccinated populations who have uh, cases of, re -inf uh, of infection, of infection, uh, particularly with the Delta variant. Um, but the majority of these are mild or asymptomatic infections. In addition, the WHO says hospitalizations are rising in some parts of the world, but it argued these are mostly where vaccination rates are low and the highly contagious Delta variant is spreading. We know that vaccines are not going to protect 100% against infection. They do confer some protection in different vaccines in the range of 60-70%. But um, you, can get, you can definitely get infected and pass it on to others. And that's why we talk about continuing to wear the masks and do the distancing and take all the precautions, even after vaccination. Um, but certainly it reduces your chances of severe harm. As it relates to vaccine supplies, the WHO says the situation is improving with the addition of more manufacturers of the AstraZeneca vaccine. AstraZeneca has led on licensing their vaccines around the world to increase vaccine capacity quickly. As well as Europe, India and South Korea 
I'm pleased to announce two more manufacturing sites in Japan and Australia, which have now received a WHO emergency use listing, bringing AstraZeneca's EULs to five. This gives the green light for COVAX to buy vaccines from these additional facilities and enables countries to expedite their own regulatory approval to import and roll out vaccines. In the meantime, the WHO is warning countries against stockpiling COVID-19 vaccines for booster shots as healthcare workers in other nations are unable to access the life-saving medicine. Some countries and regions are actually ordering millions of booster doses before other countries have had supplies to vaccinate their health workers and most vulnerable. I ask you, who would put firefighters on the front line without protection? Who are most the vulnerable to the flames of this pandemic? The health workers on the front lines, older persons, and the vulnerable. Shamela Pulan, TVJ News. And leading epidemiologist Professor Peter Figaro remains adamant that priority must be given to the most vulnerable in the population as the drive to reach herd immunity continues. His comments come in the wake of discussions about a possible third shot of the COVID-19 vaccine. We have more in this report. The possibility of a third shot of the AstraZeneca vaccine is the center of attention among several key players in the health sector across the world. Moderna, AstraZeneca and Pfizer are vaccines that currently require only two doses to be deemed safe against COVID-19. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine requires only a single shot. Now Jamaicans could be asked to roll up their sleeves for a third time in a bid to get the the deadly disease under control. But Professor Peter Figueroa believes the push for a third job is a driver for revenues. When you look at the track record of most of these big pharmaceutical companies, you realize that they make tremendous profit and that the profit motive is a huge factor driving their policies. The COVID-19 positivity rate has fallen dramatically island-wide, but the aggressive Delta variant now wreaking havoc across the globe could bring a fragile health system to its knees. It's for that reason Professor Figueroa wants those at risk to prioritize. We've got to get the most vulnerable persons who are the elderly and the frontline health workers and other frontline workers vaccinated in every country in order to protect those who are most at risk. Developed countries like Britain and the United States have moved 20% on average to over 40% of their population vaccinated. All this while other countries are struggling to achieve herd immunity. While in Africa, we do not even have 3% of the population vaccinated. And in many low- and middle-income countries, it is less than 10% of the population vaccinated. Sandy Williams, TVJ News. 36 new cases of the coronavirus were confirmed on Monday. The country's overall case count is now 50,793. The positivity rate now stands at 10.4%. Three new deaths were recorded, pushing the death toll to 1,134. In the meantime, 88 persons are hospitalized with respiratory illness, eight are critically ill. There are 8,210 active cases of COVID-19 in Jamaica. In more health-related news now, about one in every 10 Jamaican add extra salt to their diet, which can lead to serious health complications. A salt consumption study has been launched to further investigate and create awareness about the impacts of lifestyle disease on the population. It's an epidemic within the pandemic. That's according to Health Minister Dr. Christopher Tufton, while alluding to what he describes as the alarming number of lifestyle diseases caused by salt consumption. Additionally, the coronavirus puts citizens with hypertension at greater risk of dying when contracted. Salt has been linked to high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, which is stroke, heart disease and heart failure, kidney disease, kidney stones, obesity, 
osteoporosis, stomach cancers, and water retention. And I believe you saw that in the presentation. Uh, raised blood pressure is a major cause of cardiovascular disease, um, which is responsible for some 62% of stroke and 49% of coronary heart disease. It's called the Salt Consumption Knowledge Attitude Practice, Salt Cap for short. It's part of the Ministry of Health and Wellness's drive to reduce salt intake to less than 5 grams per adult, as recommended by the World Health Organization, WHO. The study, which is being funded by the National Health Fund, NHF, will cost the country $13.4 million. NHF CEO Everton Anderson says the fund paid out almost $1.5 billion last year to treat with hypertension. And the payout last year was about 5.63 billion. Of this hypertension accounted for 25%, with a total payout of 1.4 billion. So it's very important that we continue the work and the partnership to support a future where we will actually be a lot healthier and we'll be spending less on subsidizing medication. Studies show that if salt consumption reduces by at least 5 grams, it can result in a reduction in deaths by 2.5 million people. 3 million people die from health complications related to salt consumption every year. Meanwhile, Professor Trevor Ferguson, who will lead the study, explains how it will work. We want to evaluate the salt content in commonly consumed packaged foods sold in supermarkets. We also want to evaluate the sodium content in commonly used um, consumed foods in local restaurants. Um, then we will conduct a national survey to get information on knowledge, attitudes, and practices regarding salt intake in Jamaica and obtain updated estimates on current salt intake levels. Javon Keyes, TVJ News. And it's now time for a break, but please stay with us. More stories when we return. Welcome back, and we're continuing the news. The results of the 2021 primary exit profile PEP examination are to be released later this week. The Education Ministry says an online portal has been created to allow parents as well as institutions to access the results. The Ministry says this online portal is in addition to the usual methods available for accessing students' scores and placement. Now, parents of candidates who sat the exams this year and who provided email addresses were informed of this online portal via emails last week. Text messages were sent to those who provided cell numbers and others have been advised they can access the information from their children's schools. In a TVJ News follow-up now, a response this afternoon from the National Works Agency, NWA, following a major roadblock along the Friendship Main Road in St. James on Monday. The NWA is promising that the road will be fixed. Things have calmed, but this was the Friendship Main Road to Spring Mountain St. James Monday. Years we did drive on this road, and trust me, at the worst we ever see it. We don't know what they go on, but they need to do something, man. I'll make a dream and I tell me I shift patrol. Right now, Miss, who have nerves problem. When rain falls, the river comes from us, can actually any donkey, any goat, any dog. The issue spans decades. From time to time, the road is patched, but residents complain it's not enough. The National Works Agency, however, insists a permanent solution has been on the cards. It's a part of a program, a targeted program, to fix the section of roadway between the Fairfield Bridge and the Hurlock Bridge in St. James. Over the last two years, we have done, in a phased um, approach, the rehabilitation of two sections of roadway, which span the Fairfield Bridge to Friendship Roadway. And the final section now would be the section from Friendship on to Herlock. So, so far, we have done quite a bit of work in terms of rehabilitating approximately four kilometers of roadway. As it relates to when the rest of the road will be fixed. Funds permitting, we will be able to do the final section in short order. We further pressed for a timeline. 
Unfortunately, I'm not able to give a definite timeline for the repairs, but we are giving active consideration to this um, stretch of roadway. We know that it is a heavily trafficked roadway. With no definitive timeline in place, it's left to be seen if residents will take to the streets again. Cody and Barrett, TVG. Three men are now in police custody in relation to the murder of a man in Wakefield, Trelawney, yesterday morning. The dead man is 63-year-old Glenford Henry, a former disc jock of Kitchen of Kitchen Crescent in Wakefield. Now reports are that Mr. Henry was standing at his gate when three armed men approached him and opened fire. Mr. Henry was hit several times and was later pronounced dead at hospital. You don't know if you're having any enemies or anything like that? Not what I know, because you know, ex-DJ, everybody loves him, you to love him more than you are going to know things. What happened? What could, could I turn off him, you know, not, not that. Now, a .45 pistol, which is believed to be the murder weapon, was seized by the police. And it's now time for the Business Minute. Here's Cody and Barrett. In business news, the annual Christmas in July trade show will be held virtually for a second year on Thursday, July 22. About 146 participants will showcase their locally made gifts and souvenir items at this year's staging. It will be streamed live on Instagram and Facebook at TEF Jamaica and on the Tourism Enhancement Fund TEF YouTube channel beginning at 2 p.m. The event being hosted by the Tourism Linkages Network aims to provide a gifting solution to the tourism industry and, by extension, corporate Jamaica and retail consumers. The Jamaica Stock Exchange's combined market summary for last week showed the top three performers were SSL Venture Capital, Caribbean Clean Energy, and First Rock Capital Holdings. On the losing side were Portland JSX, Productive Business Solutions Limited 9.75%, and Knoxford Express Services. And in business internationally, the cost of living in the United States is on the rise. The U.S. Consumer Price Index jumped 0.9% in June alone, the largest one-month increase in 13 years. Over the last 12 months, overall prices are up 5.4%, also the biggest jump in 13 years. Much of the rise is due to gasoline prices, which are far above levels of last summer when the pandemic caused a sharp drop in driving and the price of oil. Gas prices rose 45.1% compared to last year. And coming up in the business day this evening, fisher folk calling for more support from the government. That's it for the And here now is a look at the top regional and international stories. In news from the region, Haitian police arrested a man they say helped organize the assassination of President Juvenel Moïse. The man is 63-year-old Christian Emmanuel Sanon, a Haitian national. Police say he entered the country on a private plane in June with intentions of becoming president. Authorities say Sanon was in touch with a Florida-based Venezuelan security firm to recruit 26 Colombian mercenaries and two Haitian Americans who also entered the country in June. And on the international scene, as the death toll in the Surfside condo collapsed near 100, officials said security at the location will be tightened, with only authorized personnel allowed at the site in the near future. Surfside Mayor Charles Burkett said he is speaking with city officials and families of the victims to discuss future plans at the location. So far, 83 people have been identified. 80 of their families have also been notified. For the International Roundup, I'm Shamela Pullen. Thank you, Shamela. And we head to a quick break. When we come back, we'll have your midday sports report. And Renardo Brown is standing by. Welcome back. It's now time for your midday sports. I'm Renardo Brown. Reggae Boys head coach Theodore Whitmore was not pleased with the second half performance from his team in their 2-0 win over Suriname in their opening CONCACAF Gold Cup fixture on Monday. Shamar Nicholson opened the scoring for the Reggae Boys after just six minutes before Bobby Reed doubled that advantage 20 minutes later. However, the Reggae Boys could not find another goal in the remaining 64 minutes of the contest. Whitmore, in his post-game analysis, said he was disappointed in the second-half performance. The first half we were, we managed the game, we played, we scored. But I think the second half, I think the, our team was a bit relaxed. You know, we didn't manage the game, we didn't press our opponent and we, we, we allow them to play in the game and, and, and that's what, why I sum it up. 
The Reggae Boys will next play Guadeloupe on Friday on at 5.30 p.m. Meanwhile, in the other group C fixture, Costa Rica got the better of Guadeloupe 3-1. Goals from Joel Campbell in the 6th and Ariel Lissetta in the 21st gave the Costa Ricans a 2-0 lead before Rafael Merval pulled one back for Guadeloupe. Celso Borges then got Costa Rica's third goal in the 70th minute. The Gold Cup continues today with Qatar playing at Panama at 6, while Honduras opposes Grenada at 8 p.m. Still on football, Reggae Boys midfielder Ravel Morrison, who is awaiting his U.S. visa to join the Gold Cup camp, has joined the win Rooney coached Derby County for their preseason training in England. Marson has been without a club since leaving Dutch second-tier side Ada Den Haag in January following the mutual termination of his contract. But the 28-year-old attacking midfielder has now linked up with Rooney's Derby squad as they step up preparation for the 2021-22 English Championship season. Marson trained with the Rams at Moor Farm on Monday before travelling with the rest of the squad for a pre-season training camp. According to reports, Marson will be given the chance to impress Rooney and the coaching staff with a deal potentially working for all parties. In cricket, Jamaican Chris Gale was at his destructive best to guide the West Indies to an unbeatable 3-0 lead over Australia in their five-match T20 International Series in St. Lucia on Monday following a six-wicket win. Gale, who struggled with scores of 4 and 13 in the first two matches, smashed 67 from 38 balls with four fours and seven sixes to pilot the West Indies to victory at 142 for four with 31 balls to spare. In the process, Gale, who had not passed 50 in T20 International since 2016, passed 14,000 T20 runs. Standing captain Nicholas Perrin chipped in with 32 not out as Riley Meredith took three for 48. Earlier, the West Indies bowlers strangled the Aussies batsmen to restrict Australia to 141 for 6 from their 20 overs. Hayden Walsh was the pick of the bowlers with 2 for 18 from his 4 overs, while there was a wicket apiece for Fabian Allen, Obed McCoy and Dwayne Bravo. Moses Enriquez, 33, Aaron Finch, 30 and Ashton Turner, 24 made most runs for Australia. The fourth match of the series takes place on Wednesday at the same venue. And finally, Olympic champion Omar McLeod is set to clash with countrymen Ronald Levy and Rashid Broadbell in the 110-meter hurdles at the Gateshead Diamond League meeting in London this afternoon. This will be the first meeting of all three Jamaicans this season as Broadbell missed the national championships due to injury, with McLeod ending last and Levy crowned national champion. Meanwhile, double Olympic champion Elaine Thompson Hero will contest the 200 meters where she will match strides with fellow Jamaican Natasha Morrison and Blessing Okogbari of Nigeria. 2015 world champion Daniel Williams will line up in the women's sprint hurdles along with Brittany Anderson. And another national champion in Stephanie Ann McPherson will look to extend her good season when she competes in the 400 meters, while national champion Geneve Russell will contest the 400 meter hurdles event. And that's it for your midday sports. I'm Renardo Brown. Vashon, it's back to you. All right. Thank you so much, Renardo. So another victory for the West Indies. Did you watch that match? I did. Three from three. Fantastic so far. Perun, three wins. Captain in the West Indies in three games. No, it's for the West Indies to close out the series. Maybe 4-1, 5-0. Hoping for 5-0. And, you know, I'm going to ask you about those comments from Omar McLeod yesterday. I mean, what do you think? Yeah, it, it was surprising. He took to social media after the race, the Sunday after the race, and laid out what exactly took place. But yesterday, he made some comments that somewhat contradict what he said in that post. But um, I didn't want to see that from Omar McLeod, but it's, it's just emotions. All right. Thank you so much, Renardo Brown, there with our Midday Sports Report. And that's the Midday News. I'm Vashon Brown. Join us at 7 for a primetime news package. On behalf of the news, sports, and production teams, have a wonderful afternoon. <laughs>